today's webinar. Um, the title, as everyone knows, is Roadmap for Implementing uh, NG911 GIS Data Model. Uh, this is the first of a two-part um, uh, series on this topic, and uh, hopefully you'll sign up for the second one as well. We are extremely fortunate to have uh, Melissa Leibert today, uh, who's with Comtact Telecommunications Corporation. Uh, I'm going to let Melissa tell you all about her tremendously um, uh, deep background on this topic. Uh, before I do that, I, I do want to comment that this is one of many educational opportunities that uh, ERISA offers on an ongoing basis. Um, I hope you take advantage not only of the webinars, but of workshops on this topic that we're going to be offering at the upcoming GIS Pro Conference. Uh, if you stick around right at the end, um, our uh, executive director of ERISA, Wendy Nelson, will share a little bit of information about that. Uh, but I know the reason that you're all here today is to hear the great information that Melissa has to share with us. So, Melissa, I'm going to turn the floor over to you. Thank you for that. So, hey, everybody. My name is Melissa Leibert. Um, again, I am from Comtech Telecommunications out here on the uh, West Coast. A little bit of my background before I start the presentation is I have been in the private sector for less than a year. Before I came to work for Comtech, I worked for a, a teeny tiny county in Southwest Washington um, called Waukiakum County. And so most of my 911 background, 911 experience, um, and even a majority of my GIS experience comes from my work uh, working for a small local government. So you'll hear some of uh, my experiences throughout this presentation. In addition to previously working um, for a small county, I was the chair of the Washington State NG911 GIS subcommittee. And I also um, am involved with uh, Dina, uh, Nina document creation. Um, working groups I have been involved with include the NG GIS data stewardship document, um, the standards for provisioning and maintenance of GIS data for ECRF and LVF, and then the GIS data model template. I've presented multiple times at um, both the local Washington chapter of ERISA and also ERISA GIS Pro conferences pretty much solely on the topic surrounding next generation 911 and the best practices for the data development and maintenance. Currently, I serve on the ERISA NG911 task force, which is the group involved in creating these uh, next-generation specific webinars. And um, I still uh, sit on several um, active NINA working groups. Um, at, at Comtech, I do sit um, as a kind of a top GIS advisor for our state um, deployment customers, and I uh, help the states and local gover government to ensure smooth transitions into a next generation 911 world, which is really where we are. Um, I will say that different states and different deployment areas are, are different um, in different stages of next generation 911 transition. I understand uh, some of you probably on this call um, are new to the concept surrounding next generation 911, and some of you probably consider yourselves or, or, or are. Um, old hats on the top topic. This first part one uh, presentation will be specifically on the polygon aspect of the GIS data model. The second part um, will be on the um, road center line and site structure address point and more information on that. So with that, I will get us started. So just as a brief background, so what is the data model? Data model came out, the final version came out uh, in 2018 after almost a decade of development. 
um, many or some of you on the call may have been involved with that development. If you were a big hats off um, to you, because I know it was a bear to um, develop. So the NINA standard for NG911GIS data model, it helps define the GIS um, that supports NINA Next Generation 911 or NG911 core services. It helps with location validation and routing, um, both for geospatial call routing and for appropriate agency dispatch. I will say that um, when I'm using the term routing in this presentation, or when you hear the term routing in most next generation 911 presentations, we're talking about call routing. We're not talking about vehicle routing, and there is um, a distinction between those two routing processes. So this model um, defines several GIS data layers used in a PSAP, which stands for Public Safety Answering Point, and response agency mapping applications for handling and responding to those 911 calls. The data structure in this document is related to the data structure that's defined in what's called the I3 standard which is NINA STA010, and it's in Appendix B. And the Appendix B describes the spatial interface, or SI, and the, the purpose of the SI is to provision um, functional elements, which some of those we'll discuss on this webinar, um, which include the emergency call routing function and the location validation function, both of which use the, the GIS data so this document more describes the structure that can be used in those other functional elements. And there is a link at the, um, that will be included in this presentation for your consumption at a later date um, at the bottom of this slide for those that you, of you who are interested. So why is it needed? Um, standardization is extremely important. So a new to kind of the NG system is something called, that's referred to as the PIDA flow, P-I-D-F-L-O, which is that presence information, data, format, location, object. And in the U.S., the uh, format that that location object takes is called the Civic Location Data Exchange Format, CLDXS. Within the, the data model, there are uh, CLDXF compliant fields within the road center line and site structure address point layers. Again, those will be discussed in the part two of this webinar. Another reason why the GIS data model was needed was consistency between jurisdictions. And so you don't have a jurisdiction in California um, having a completely different system, a different data schema than that of Maine, which is how the uh, enhanced 911 system is today. And so the, the goal is to get all GIS data under one schema. And so that, um, that interoperability component is there. So if one uh, PSAP goes down in, in a state or um, a region, then somebody else will be able to pick it up and use the exact same data without having to worry about um, compatibility issues necessarily with their software. The NINA data model is also backwards compatible. So we talk a lot about um, the CLDXF compliant fields and that type of data, but Nina and its develop, the document developers are, are very aware that a next generation 911 is more than just flipping a switch and suddenly all the PSAPs are uh, next generation 911 compliant, all the um, telephone carriers are next generation 911 compliant. They understand that there has to be some backwards comp compatibility in systems that are referred to as legacy systems. So the, the two main systems are your next gen, which is very much GIS based, um, location based um, versus legacy, which is more tabular based.
if you've ever seen kind of a, a big blown out version of a next generation system, um, this, is, this is just a clip um, created by Steve O'Connor um, back for APCO in 2012 that kind of shows that it's cloud-based, next generation 911 is, and just the different components. You have the emergency um, call routing function, you have the uh, location validation function, so those are the two uh, main GIS components that are going to be brought up in this call. For even more detail, you kind of have your, your GIS database, and you um, that data gets um, honestly provisioned into that spatial interface. But eventually, it lands into a location object to service translation, which is funnily called LOST, um, within the emergency call routing function, and that that translation um, service is utilized by like location validation function, um, the ECRS, and then eventually is, is spat out to the PSAP side of the business. Just more graphical representation of what's going on. So your ECRF emergency call routing function, it provides information um, to the caller or to the agency about where you're located. And the next generation 911 system is all about layers and, and exploding your um, location into several layers. And so as you can see on the graphic, um, that can either be a, a civic location or a geodetic XY location. And that's laid on top um, so that, that information comes through, and then the system then looks at the road center line, makes sure that it, it's a valid set of information to the road center line, and then it looks like, well, where does that point in that road center line land? Does it, is it in a PSAP A or a PSAP B? And even uh, one step in between those um, or associated with them is which response agencies are associated with that call, be it a fire law, EMS, or even extended to things like uh, poison control or the Coast Guard. The location validation function, that is more outside of the NG EZNet um, used for uh, validation of information prior to the call being made. So it's similar to, if, if you're familiar with today's ALI system, the LVF is very, very similar um, and it will be utilized uh, similar to today's ALI. As with all best practices for GIS um, is the metadata. And there's a section in the NINA data model that speaks specifically to metadata and the uh, metadata standard FGCS CGC. So this uh, may be a, a drum being beat, but it's really important that metadata exists in your data that you're producing for next generation 911, because again, it's that interoperability and being able to verify that the data is coming from a, a verified source and it's not um, malicious information coming in. So having that, you know, identifying, um, providing a brief narrative of your data, summarizing the purpose, which is often, you know, emergency management, 911, um, your contact information, if somebody wants to find out more about how your data was built, make sure that that is up to date. Um, I would recommend that you, um, for your contact, it's more your um, center or your, or your data source rather than a personal contact, just because you might not be there in, in 5, 10, 15 years, and somebody may need to contact your jurisdiction regarding your data. Uh, quality is just explaining the accuracy um, and the standards that were followed. Your spatial reference, which we'll, we'll get into the standard for that for NG. Um, your lineage, you know, how it was constructed. Sometimes it will include a, a legal portion just in case there's constraints on the sharing of your 911 data, you know, can't be used for um, commercial purposes or the, you know, it can only be distributed for 911. 
the temporal focusing on um, when the data was was created or collected or or even updated um, the metadata reference and then the GIS metadata standards, which again is um, guidelines from the Federal Geographic Data Committee, F FGDC, and also ISO 19115. So it is, um, it might not be in your current workflow to be updating your metadata, but um, if it's not, it should be just as basic uh, GIS best practices but especially for it's especially important in a next generation environment when your data will likely someday be um, used by a different jurisdiction and they need to verify its authenticity. Another basic of the data model is the NINA globally unique ID. Each of the GIS layers in the data model has uh, an NGU ID. The recommended construction of that given out by Nina is using a, a local ID for this example has a local road ID, which is um, that road centerline RCL and then the number and then adding an agency identifier. This the reason why you can't um, just leave your data as um, you know, Johnson way, you know, using just the street name or even a local, you know, one, two, three, four, five is because of the possibility that while the one, two, three, four, five might be unique to your jurisdiction, well, if there's a jurisdiction across the, across the country who also wants to use that exact same identifier. And so to prevent any duplication of ID numbers, um, it has to be, unique to you and that and that agency identifier often is the key to making it unique because you could still have a one two three four five and then at say county.wa.us a helpful portion of the id is that rcl because you can um, for your road center line you could use rcl to use the the road id but for a site structure address point, you could use SSAP, or for a PSAP layer, you could use PSAP, you know, PSAP 1234. So it's just a quick item that at a quick glance, you know exactly what um, layer is being referred to by the feature because you have that um, identifier right at the beginning. Again, not required. Um, I just have found it's very useful to identify what layer the feature is in by using that abbreviation. More basics. So spatial reference. So your spatial interface, which is going to be um, the, the mechanism that feeds your ESINET, and for uh, ECRF LVIP purposes, purposes, the data has to be in WGS84. Now, it's not required that you maintain your local data at WGS84. WGS if you have a, a local state plane, um, that's fine. Just make sure when your data gets translated that no errors are introduced, especially when you're looking at um, polygons or when data shifts during that transformation process, it can introduce errors. A recommendation out of the data model is to actually just create and maintain your data at uh, using WGS84. I know there's some issues with uh, maintaining your data using that, but it is a recommendation. And the reason why, again, is that when you do a translation um, or a reprojection, that there's there's no stretching or tearing um, of your data. Horizontal accuracy um, is the NSDI standard of one to 5,000, which is about a 13, plus or minus 13.89 feet um, confidence level. That might be higher than your local standard and might be a cost to the jurisdiction to get it um, at that horizontal, horizontal accuracy level. And that's understood. It's just outlined in the data model as a goal um, so that if you need to put it in, in some budget line, um, you, had, you have a standard to support your work. 
Okay, getting more into the meat of the data model. The data model has required, strongly recommended, and recommended layers. The ones that we care about in this presentation are, again, the, the provisioning boundary and the emergency service boundary, which is your PSAP, your EMS, your fire, and your law. Strongly recommended and recommended. So your strongly recommended um, or your, your recommended layers could be layers that your local CAD system utilizes and you want to continue to maintain those such as um, like railroad crossings um, or some, something local. Um, the, the strongly recommended um, layers, I will say that like the site structure address point used to be a strongly, strongly recommended and now it is a uh, required layer. So for the site structure address point, that's another expensive layer um, to produce. And um, that again will be discussed in part two. Also, when reading through the GIS data model, you'll see attribute conditions, um, mandatory, conditional, or optional, M, C, and O. So mandatory, you have to populate it, like the NGU ID discussed earlier. Again, you have to populate it because your Johnson way is gonna be maybe the exact same information as a different Johnson way somewhere else in the country as to not get them confused in the system, NGU ID super important. Conditional, does it exist? If it yes, you have to populate it. If no, leave it blank. A conditional field example, there's actually no conditional field examples in the polygon layers that we're going to discuss today, um, but just to put the information out there in the data model under the road center line, there is an ESN left and ESN right and um, those are conditional. And so if it exists in your data, great. Um, put, you have to put it in. If it doesn't, it's okay to leave it blank. Optional, um, which is up to you. If you wanna put it in, great. If you don't, great. Um, an optional could be like the service number, which we'll discuss later. If it's, if it's useful information, um, I know sometimes when you put a lot of information out there, you have to maintain a lot of information. So it's just something to keep in mind when you're populating those optional fields. So let us talk about the provisioning boundary. So the provisioning boundary is defined as the area of GIS data provisioning responsibility with no unintentional gaps or overlaps. That last portion, no unintentional gaps or overlaps, is echoed throughout all of the polygon related documentation like you just you don't you don't want holes um, especially large holes because if a call comes in where is it going to go it's going to you know default routing type situation so you want the call to well in general you want the call to go where it belongs um, the provisioning boundary all the stakeholders involved need to agree oftentimes the stakeholder is you and your neighboring jurisdiction uh, neighboring PSAP it's used by the ECRF and it's provisioning boundary because it excludes um, features outside of that boundary. And so another jurisdiction can't attempt to send in GIS data to the SI or be used in the ECRF outside of that boundary. This is a newer layer. So let's look at some graphics. So this is a active PSAP. And you can see the difference between a provisioning boundary and a PSAP boundary. So the PSAP boundary has lots of teeny tiny polygons. Um, you can see by the different colors that each one of those colors represents a different PSAP. Each of the PSAPs are not provisioning their own data into the SI. That is the purpose of the provisioning boundary. As you can see, a lot of it almost looks like things got dissolved. So a lot of the, um, so that boundary, there's gonna be one person or one agency involved in submitting all of that data for the, 
let me get this, there we go. Now you can see what I'm, I'm pointing at. So this entire provisioning boundary is then submitting data for all of these teeny tiny PSAPs. Now it could be that these PSAPs are submitting it to the provisioning agency and then that provisioning agency is submitting it on behalf of those PSAP boundaries. Instead of PSAP, you can even look at that uh, maybe as a, a city jurisdiction. So that city is submitting data to a provisioner and then the provisioner is then putting it into the uh, SI for processing within the ESINET. So that is the difference between a provisioning and a PSAP boundary. Here's another example of a provisioning boundary versus a PSAP boundary. And so this green polygon area is actually it's a county too and a, and a, a PSAP. But for PSAP um, and call routing purposes, this section is actually routed to um, this county or this PSAP. And so even though this county is sending in the data for this area, calls from this area are actually being routed to this PSAP. The provisioning boundary is, is one of the smallest uh, schema sections of the data model. You can see that there are only five um, fields, discrepancy, agency ID, date updated, effective date, expiration date, and provisioning boundary NINA global unique ID, which is that NGU ID. As I outlined earlier, you can see this MCO. So you see you have your mandatory fields and your optional fields. So agency, discrepancy agency ID is required, your date update is required, and then your uh, provisioning boundary NGU ID is required. There's also field width um, restrictions listed over here. Your effective date and your expiration date. I'll go to the next slide to kind of break that out. So your discrepancy ID is that is that going to be the agency that receives the discrepancy report, which is um, like a, an error report. Um, should discrepancies be discovered, and that agency will then take responsibility for ensuring that the discrepancy is resolved. This um, is pretty important. Um, and it might, may or may not be the same as the 911 authority. This could be the, um, um, the, the city if they're the, the source of the data. The agency does need to be defined, um, or it needs to be uh, registered um, to be used. The date updated is also a mandatory field, and this is the recommended format of the the data and it just needs to have the date and time that the record was created or last modified your effective date and expiration date are both optional these are really useful if you have uh, maybe an annexation ha happening and so and, and a date for that annexation and so you know when um, the a polygon should be affected um, and put into the system or the opposite, if there's an area that is going to expire and you have the date, um, that, that expiration field can be used. And then lastly, the provisioning boundary, NINA Global Unique ID, mandatory. Again, you have that PB, which represents provisioning boundary. Um, you can put in a local number um, that, that identifies what you're looking at, and then you'll put um, the domain name at the end. The next section is emergency service boundaries. So that's your PSAP boundary, your law, your fire, and your EMS. Within the data model, it actually separates out your PSAP boundary from your law, fire, and EMS when it was written. But conceptually, um, like within the ECRF 
the LVS and other I3 components, um, such as like MSI conversion service, the geocode service, and the map display service. The PSAP boundary um, it, it is an emergency service boundary. In every respect, it is um, equivalent to an emergency service boundary and uses the same, what's called the service URN, which we will discuss shortly. It is defined as the geographic area for primary providers of responsive agencies. So going back to the point I just made, you can consider your PSAP, which is where the call lands, um, as your responsive uh, service. Your, again, the stakeholders must agree, same as provisioning boundary. The, it determines who's responsible for providing service to a location. Um, it can be used for the emergency incident data document, and it is also utilized by the ECRS. So your ESB, um, breaking that down is just, it routes calls um, and emergency requests for NG911. This is a little bit more complicated sometimes when you're building it, because your, especially like your law, fire, and EMS probably has some legalese um, associated with it. So sometimes getting your stakeholders to agree is a little bit more of a challenge. It can even be a challenge for a PSAP boundary, but um, I've found that the challenges often arise when you're looking at more of the specific response services. So in e, uh, enhanced 911, or maybe even in your modern, modern systems, you may have a layer called the emergency, or your, like your ESN or emergency service zone layer as displayed here. And so your ESN, ESC, um, ESN is used probably in your master street address guide, um, MSAG service, and it's just a, a number that represents the combination of services, your combination of fire, law, EMS, and puts that just into a, a simple number. In next generation 911, you need to explode out, um, extract out all of the different services from your, that ESN, ESZ layer into distinct uh, polygon uh, layer groups. So you'll have your fire, you'll have your law, and you have your EMS. Now, if you combine those, again, that would make probably your, e your ESZ um, for NG purposes. It's important to have them in uh, separate. And that is oftentimes um, necessary because then you know, you know which fire agency and then which law and then which EMS. Again, everything needs to have no um, unintentional gaps or overlaps. There needs to be some agency responding to some area, be it um, DNR or a, a tax-based um, system. Your ESB has a lot more fields than your provisioning boundary does. Some of them are familiar, your discrepancy agency ID. Again, who's going to get that discrepancy report? Who's gonna fix, who's gonna be responsible for um, getting those errors resolved? Date updated, effective date, expiration date, all the same as the last one. Um, again, for annexation purposes, oftentimes that effective date or expiration date can be utilized. You have another NGUID, emergency service boundary, uh, NGUID this time, and then state, pretty basic, um, your uh, agency ID, service URI, so your service URN, service number, agency V card URI, and display name, which we will discuss. If your jurisdiction, PSAP, does cross state lines, it does need to be broken at that border. And so you'll, um, even if it's the same maybe agency, you will need to make the, the polygon, because an attribute has changed. If you're in, say, Washington, and, you have, and your PSAP goes, reaches into Idaho, you'll need to split it between that Washington and Idaho border. Breaking down some of those new fields when compared to the provisioning boundary. So your agency ID looks pretty similar to um, what we had uh, previously just with that domain type format. You have your emergency service boundary in a global unique ID. 
So for example, PSAP 7 at 911 authority underscore domain dot state dot US or fire FD1 at 911 authority underscore domain dot state dot US. Easily identified, fire, PSAP, which layer we're actually talking about. Your service number is the number that would be dialed on a standard 12 digit keypad to reach the emergency service appropriate for the location. So this is not the same as an ESN in the legacy E911 system. Um, this field is used in all of the ESBs, emergency service boundaries. Um, sometimes it can be 911, you know, if you're trying to reach your PSAP. Um, sometimes it can be a specific to the service. Agency vCard URI um, is just a vCard file format um, electronic business card, which oftentimes is just another uh, similar to that. It could be your discrepancy agency. It could be specific to your um, service. Um, just where where's the URL to get the contact information. And then your display name, which is probably one of the best um, crossovers from E911. What, what is your agency called? And make sure that it's description, uh, it's descriptive of the, the service provider. It has to be suitable for display. So um, if you have some secret sauce um, squirrel name that you use locally, that's not really useful for another jurisdiction. So just make sure it's, it's really clear like New York, PD uh, or police department, and then also make sure that it falls within that 60 character limit. I know for some places that might be a challenge if you have a really long name um, for your jurisdiction. Going more specifically into that service URN, service URI. So the service URN is used to select the service for which to route, which the, which a route is desired. Um, your so it identifies a particular category of resources within a uh, ESI net. So example URN colon Nina colon service colon SOS dot PSAP. Could be SOS dot fire SOS dot EMS. Your service URI is used for call routing and is uh, usually a SIP URI, but which is, this is an example. So SIPs colon SOS PSAP dot PSAP. This is likely going to be assigned to you on a vendor by vendor basis of whatever uh, format or value. So it's likely not going to be assigned by your jurisdiction. Um, you're not gonna be able to just give it whatever value um, you need because that's used in, in multiple systems. And so definitely reach out to your NG EZNet provider um, to determine what your service URI is going to be and what format um, it's going to be in. This is just the example that was given within the NINA data model document. So the, this is another simplified version, kind of seeing where that URN and that URI come in. So PIDAflow um, CLDXF format goes through this border control function, kind of like a firewall, gets put into the ESRP, they're in, to, they're in constant communication with each other, um, and then it spits out a uh, PSAP URI, which then goes again through a firewall and lands at a PSAP. Since this is, um, if you would like more information on this process, I invite you to go to Nina. They have some documentation out there. Um, explore that I3 document, um, STA 010.2, um, if you'd like more information. So where to start? Now that you are up to date on these Polygon requirements, um, first, talk to your neighbors, be that your, your neighboring fire departments, your neighboring um, EMS 
departments, your, your law departments, your, your PSEPs. The point of Next Generation 911 is not that everything is in these silos and these vacuums and you don't and you, and you can ignore your neighbors. The point is that we get this big nationwide global, maybe even eventually system that is cohesive, it is uh, overlap and gap free, and it's agreed upon by all of the stakeholders. I realize that is probably far in the future, but what you can do today is talk to your neighbors and make sure and, and share data sets. Make sure that where you believe the line is, your neighbor believes the line is, and, and talk to each other and you know make snap points and, and snap things and make sure everyone's on the, the same page. You can even uh, make agreements with each other. You know, I won't if I make a change, then I will, you know, inform you. And put something down on paper just you know if there's personnel changes then someone else coming in knows oh yeah if i make a change this is going to impact more than my jurisdiction um, things again don't happen in a in a vacuum another place a good place to start is to ensure your data has no gaps and no overlaps very important internal or external obviously your external gaps overlaps might take a little bit more work um, so work on internal make sure that the things in your house are in order and then when they are, go external. And actually, I would make sure that things are, are in order um, before you ex go external, because if, if you go external first and then go internal, that you know you have to you have to make sure everything is set to that external um, boundary rather than which could cause you more of a headache in the end. Um, so I definitely would recommend starting your data internal. There's also the uh, NINA information document for GIS data stewardship for Next Generation 911. The first version of that is published um, and available online at that uh, link that's showing on the screen. I invite you to read the document. It has some really good information, um, some good maintenance practices. There, it, it is specific to the PSAP boundary, the emergency, more general emergency service boundary. Um, and the road center line stewardship groups are currently meeting um, to develop that document, but there is a, a starting document that outlines a phased approach to getting started with your development. If the schema is a little bit scary to you, Nina has developed a GIS data template to get you started. It's, it's not a standard, it's not, um, a requirement that you use the data template provided, but if you're starting from scratch or don't really feel like building out a schema and then um, having to deal with that type of work, there is a Python script available both in an open source format and in an Esri based format um, available at Nina um, that you can download from the Python, uh, from the Python script and it will uh, produce for you a hollow uh, geo database that has all the fields there and then you just need to, to populate them with your uh, local data so that's all i have for the presentation i'm pretty sure there there were lots of questions that were were coming in um, as we were talking so kevin do we want to work on the questions sure or do you want to go on to the last portion yeah, we can do that. Although I'll tell you what, uh, the biggest one that came up is what um, what are good sources for people that might be on the call who don't have a strong background in NG911 to learn about you know, what the foundational knowledge is. If you're not aware of the chat um, that's part of this meeting, I encourage you to move your cursor towards the bottom of the screen and you'll be able to actually view the chat window. In that window, you're going to find a variety of links uh, that Wendy Nelson posted to some other materials that ERISA has put up together, uh, webinar, FAQs, um, and also inclusion of some information about a workshop coming up at GIS Pro that we'll talk a little bit more about. And Melissa, you had mentioned some resources too from Nina. You might have some other suggestions. Um, and while you're maybe talking about that, I would encourage uh, those on the call, I think we still got something like nearly 60 people on the call, take advantage of that chat window and enter your questions. We've got some time to answer them and would love to do that. So Melissa, you wanna talk a little bit about so, resources? 
Yep. So Nina is the prime source of resources. I will say some of their documents are a little bit dense. Um, one of them being that I3 uh, STA 010 document. Um, it is very technical and I wouldn't necessarily recommend if, you, if you're new to next generation, like just diving into the I3 document, it'll probably scare you and you'll never want to touch NG911 again. Um, but there are some more, I would say, user-friendly documents. The data stewardship uh, document that I mentioned is a great resource. Honestly, the NG911 data model, it's, it's very clearly laid out. Um, I can't, you really don't necessarily need to be um, technically minded um, to read it. It's, it, it gives you examples for every field that is mentioned. There is an example in the back of the document as to how you can take your current data and move it into um, next generation 911 compliance. Those are, are definitely the two main resources. Again, um, URISA is putting out some fantastic um, workshops and full day programs um, for Baltimore. And so if you're available um, to attend those conferences, that's also a great way to um, learn Next Generation 911. I do believe also that uh, URIS is working on a mentorship track and, and program um, to help uh, people, if they have questions, they have a direct contact with somebody who's uh, NG911 knowledgeable and free, feel free um, after this, my contact information is up on the screen. Feel free to shoot me an email. And if I don't know the answer, um, I know some very smart people and I can direct your question to them. So a couple of other questions um, on my part, and, and I see another one I'll, I'll bring to your attention here that just got entered. Um, at some point, if you could speak to maybe what part two of this uh, webinar series on, on what you're doing today is going to cover. Um, and then also, uh, the other question that just came in a minute ago, let's see, um, uh, is from Thad and he says, our E911 software vendor doesn't currently follow the 91 NINA model and in their CAD software. And could you please provide a statement of support to get vendors to adopt the standard? Um, and actually let me kind of build on that. I, I, really don't know the range of skills and experiences and responsibilities of the of people on the call. Uh, I think it might be interesting for you to comment if you could on how you get involved in NG911 if you're just learning about it today, what, you know, if depending on what your role is in your community, um, who you might want to reach out to in, in order to make sure that your voice is heard and that you're at the table in the conversation. So maybe you could tackle that. So if you need a statement of support, I fully 100% support that CAD software and carriers and everybody else involved in the next generation or even 911 world need to adopt this standard stop point, whatever you need. Um, unfortunately, I do not have the power or, or magic wand to wave to get uh, CAD vem vendors to um, to adopt the standard. It is a standard. Um, and so it likely won't scare them, but if you need to um, bop them on the head, it makes a pretty good uh, roll and, and bat um, if you need to use it as a, as a physical tool. But in all seriousness, um, yes, the E911 software vendors do need to be NINA compliant. Um, sometimes, depending on your SI vendor, um, you can you can kind of live in the legacy world, your E911 world, and your next generation because you know they'll they'll only capture um, the next generation 911 fields in your data, and we and they won't touch um, fields that might be utilized in your CAD system. But that's a vendor by vendor solution. Um, definitely a conversation to have. Every, every jurisdiction, every state's different. Uh, for example, in Washington State, there's 39 counties, there's even more PSAPs, um, all the GIS is developed on a local level, and then um, those, uh, those local PSAPs or provisioners then send it to a state-run um, spatial interface, and there's a spatial interface um, vendor associated with that. Every state's different, um, and every state is the, the 
the processes of how to get things done are different. If, I mean, if you can talk to your, your state, your local state or regional um, person about adopting it on a, you know, on, on whatever, on a statewide level, you know, making an official statement that, you know, we're, my state or whatever is going to adopt the standards that can help. Um, the FCC is, is probably the biggest agency that, that has a stick and um, but they're you know they they deal with the carriers and, and a bunch of different pieces so sh so long statement short yes i support it um yes the cad vendors need to do it i would be actively pressuring um your cad vendor to to be adopting the 911 data model if you're currently uh, in between contracts um there's plenty of cad vendors out there who are 911 um, Nina standard compliant. Um, look at them, you know, if, if push comes to shove and, and change your vendors, which I know isn't ideal and it's an expensive process. Um, but there, there's no easy bridge um, or easy path for, forward to get everybody on the same page. All, we, all Nina can do is keep producing standards and then pressuring um, all the vendors to use it. Uh, are there any other questions? I, I'm uh, looking at the chat room. If there's anybody that has questions, we're lucky to have Melissa with us today and we'd love to take advantage of her, her expertise. Um, while we're waiting, do you want to maybe speak a little bit to what the next, uh, if you know, what the next webinar is, is going to cover on this, part two? Yeah, so part two, again, is going to, so we talked about the polygons, which is a good foundational, um, you need to get your polygons uh, in order because then you get to move on to the, the fun stuff, the really useful layers, which is the road center line, RCL, and the site structure address point layer, which um, they have far more um, attributes associated with them. There are a lot of rules uh, regarding how to parse out your addresses. Um, it, you know, there is some, as we all likely know on the call, there's some creative addressing and creative road name mechanisms throughout the country. And so the, the next part two will speak a lot um, on, on that, not probably not only on the, the actual data model and how to parse out your data properly, or at least up to standard, um, but addresses some of the development challenges and, and recommendations that the NG911 uh, USA task force can make to the wider community. Perfect. So I, I'm going to give a real quick plug to the ERISA task force. I'm, I'm uh, honored to be a ERISA board member and, and one of our uh, you know, really phenomenal parts of what the organization about is about, and, and I know Melissa, you would echo this, is that opportunity to get involved in the committees and task forces. This is one example, a really good one, of the kind of work that volunteers can do when they get together to do something meaningful. Um, and I, Thank you for your commitment to that. For those that are on the call uh, that want to get involved and not just hear about what's there, but to be part of that process, just reach out. Um, those opportunities are very much available. We'd love to have you be part of, of the uh, core volunteers in ERISA that makes it possible to do what we do as an organization. Uh, and on that front, um, Melissa, thank you so much uh, for presenting today. Um, I'm going to give the floor to Wendy Nelson, maybe to uh, do a wrap up, tell you a little bit about what ERISA has coming up. Um, it's exciting to say the least. Wendy? Oh, yeah, thanks, Kevin. And I realized that you didn't introduce yourself when we started this. <laughs> I realized Kevin, that a minute ago, actually. <laughs> Kevin Mickey is ERISA's president elect, and he is. Uh, the Director of Professional Development and Geospatial Technologies Education um, for IUPUI in Indianapolis. So he knows education. He's a good person to know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if you want to advance the screen once more, Melissa, one more slide, I can talk a little bit about the programs that we have coming up. Um, probably doesn't apply to many of you who, who are on the call, but we have a conference uh, in Louisville uh, in a few weeks on GIS and valuation technology. So that's more about using GIS particularly in the assessor's office. Um, and then we have our GIS Leadership Academy, which if you haven't heard of it yet, 
Um, please check it out. It's five days of GIS leadership and management training. It's incredibly successful. A lot of word of mouth um, promotion happens when you know people attend it and then they come back to their office and they go to another GIS meeting and they're like, hey, you have to go to the Leadership Academy. It's, uh, it's kind of like our claim to fame now. And we have three uh, programs coming up, June in Minneapolis, August in Portland, Oregon, and then in November we're ending the year in St. Petersburg, Florida. Um, and we've mentioned a few times uh, Baltimore. We have our GIS Pro 2020 conference uh, in the fall as well. Uh, we just uh, concluded uh, soliciting presentation proposals for that one. We have an entire program track that's going to be put together on NG911 and GIS. Um, so if you can come to Baltimore, I'm sure you'll get a lot more questions answered about the topic. Um, we'll have at least one workshop there on NG911, and uh, you'll get to meet all of your fellow members. The, we currently have an NG911 half-day workshop that is frequently presented at local chapters and such. And it's even something that if you can get a, a, a good group of people at your organization or in your region together, you might want to consider hosting that workshop as well to get everybody some hands-on um, in-person training. But the other opportunity for ERISA members, um, hopefully you've been on ERISA Connect already. We have an NG911 community set up, which um, our task force is involved with. It's a great place to pose questions about NG911 and all of those little abbreviations that none of us really know what it is. <laughs> but we will ask, um, ask the task force to post some more information on that community. And if you have any questions at all about any of our programs or or getting on to ERISA Connect and joining that community, please don't hesitate to let me know. And with that, I would love to thank Melissa and Kevin and everybody who signed up and attended the workshop, the webinar today. And uh, stay tuned for uh, the next monthly webinar, uh, which is part of your ERISA membership. So thank you, everybody, and hope to see you soon. <laughs>